Hello, everyone. We are back with our Carbon Health Q&As for various physicians so you can learn more about different specialties and trends that are ongoing in healthcare. And today I'm really excited to be joined back again by Dr. Lelita Abiyankar, who is a family physician and a medical director for Carbon Health. And this is perfect because Carbon Health recently launched artificial intelligence or AI to help with charting for their electronic health records in all of their clinics and for all of their providers. So I'm going to turn it over to Lelita, who can just give a bit of information about what does AI in healthcare even look like? Yeah, thanks, Rob. It's, it's absolutely amazing to be back. It's, it was fun last time, and I'm really excited to talk to you again. AI in healthcare is such a big topic. I think everybody has been talking about what the applications for AI actually are. And in healthcare, I think one of the biggest ways to use it is really a lot of like clerical tools. So how can the clinical decision making not necessarily be replaced, but rather be supported by, you know, synthesis reporting and all of the other aspects of the kind of the tedious work that needs to be done in order to make sure that patient care runs smoothly. I think other ways that people have tried to use AI in healthcare is over the last 10 years or so, over the last 20 years, I guess, the information out there has also just kind of exploded. So there's so much out there that one person just can't necessarily kind of piece together all of the different data and all of the different information that's out there. So like AI has also been used to, or is I think people are trying to use AI to kind of aggregate all of that information and, and make sure that recommendations are really looking at all of the different research that's out there as well. Also, like when we start to do that, when we start to use AI as a clinical decision-making tool, which I don't think we're at yet, we really start to be mindful of things like bias that can be introduced into decision-making in general. And so, AI in healthcare can be really helpful, as I can't wait to tell you about in terms of like what we've been doing here at Carbon. And also, I think that we need to be mindful of how AI is applied to healthcare decision making so as not to exacerbate or worsen biases in general. Yeah, I love that you brought up some of the things that are you know, currently ongoing and what we're looking for and then what could be potential stuff that's happening in the future. So I think it pivots great to a question that we had from the audience member about what does Carbon Health's AI look like today? Yeah, so that's super exciting. It's something that I'm really excited to talk about. A few weeks ago, we released our AI charting tool. So that is this opportunity where patients come into my office and I am able to record our conversation and it generates through kind of like a chat GPT-esque model, a note for me. And so I think that the best story that I have is that I saw 20 new patients a couple weeks ago. It was really like, typically that would be a lot of cognitive burden for me in order to like make sure that I'm piecing together all of these different people. But the fact that I was able to kind of record our conversation meant that I was done with my notes within 15 minutes of finishing all of my visits. And I went home and I had the energy to actually like cook a meal for myself. So I think that that's kind of like what I'm most excited about, where I don't feel like I'm coming home and like sitting on the couch and scrolling, like I actually have the mental capacity to do the things that I want. And so we talk a lot about burnout in healthcare. We talk a lot about moral injury. We talk a lot about these different concepts, especially when it comes to physicians in general, especially post pandemic. And I think that if we can kind of work with these sorts of tools and this sort of application for artificial intelligence, I really think that we would have more people going into healthcare and having more longevity, especially in primary care, like, which is what I do. And since this is so novel in the healthcare field, is it difficult to adapt a new method for delivering care? No, it's not. I mean, I, I think it's novel in a lot of different fields right now. There's a lot of applications for this sort of generative reporting or writing tool. I think that the reason that I have adapted so easily to this particular tool is because it doesn't, it really seamlessly integrates into like what I do day to day. So it's not impeding my workflow. It's actually allowing me to free up space and talk to the patient directly. I'm not worried whether or not like, oh, am I gonna catch this detail? Am I gonna catch that detail? In fact, sometimes the AI charting tool will actually bring in anecdotes 
that I probably wouldn't have remembered to write. And so it's been really easy to adapt to. In fact, it's still in its early stages, so it glitches sometimes. And so it's still on me to make sure that I have all of the information in my head for sure. It's noticeable when it's not working. So I think that for the most part, I have been able to use it relatively consistently. If we're doing like a big update or the day that we released it from like our small pilot to like the whole company, those were like challenging days because I think they were, you know, really trying to kind of expand into a new level. And so the, the tool wasn't working optimally and I definitely felt it. And you mentioned too that this AI technology can be used in so many different fields. So what was some of the background on why did Carbon Health use AI for hands-free charting? And what was that piloting process like when you were going through it? Yeah, it was really interesting. A couple months ago, I think around the time that ChatGPT was released, we had a couple of people in leadership who were like really curious about this particular application for AI. You know, we had been talking about getting scribes for our providers who see high volumes. We had talked about what are other kind of tools and options. And I think internally, everybody was just kind of like, let's build it. At least this is the story that I hear from like the engineering and like the product team in general. What that looked like from a clinician perspective is my job was to ask patients if I could record our conversation. But the purpose of it, like that I was still going to be documenting, but that in the future, we would have a tool that would allow me to synthesize what we were talking about. And so I had a number of patients over the next couple of weeks who were willing to like let me record our conversation. And I was still writing my own charting notes at the time. And I think there was maybe five or six of us as clinicians who were doing this. And a couple of weeks after we did that, or like kind of through an ongoing process, certain recordings would be selected. They would be filtered through the AI tool. We would get back different examples of these notes. And then it was as like a feedback process, we would be like, yes, this is accurate, this isn't. For example, like if I have a patient who happens to be a musician, like we would have a very long conversation about their music and all of that would be included in these notes. And so like, how do you set parameters to make sure that the conversational piece, like that it's mostly the medical information that's being recorded. And later on, like now even, if there's a conversational item or like there's something that I want about that patient to be included in the note and it's like skipping over it, I can always go back and edit. But those kinds of filters on like, how do you get the relevant information? How do you summarize in a thoughtful way? How do you make sure that these problems are being captured or the different things that the patients are actually talking about are included in this final note? A lot of that was like this back and forth process with clinicians who were involved in the original recording process. I like that how you mentioned this rigor and reproducibility basically aspect of the technology. Cause I think that that's something that can often be missed in like the general public who maybe doesn't always know about typical foundation for putting out some new type of method or a new treatment option. Like we always have these very stringent ways of making sure that something works and testing it on multiple people with multiple people. So I really enjoy hearing that the AI goes through the same exact process. Yeah. yeah. And after all, I mean, it's an algorithm, right? At the end of the day, it's like, it is a mathematical tool that can be refined as it goes based on the data that you're feeding it. And so it does require a lot of iterations in order to get it to the point where it's actually doing the output that you want it to. So I think that that was a really interesting process for me to go through as well. So I know before you mentioned some of the personal ways that AI has really helped you in your practice, but do you have any other additional early results that you could share with everyone on how AI has helped the practice in Carbon Health? The after you actually uh, complete the recording, it takes about four minutes to produce a chart. So like that note kind of generates into our note section of the EHR within four minutes, which is why like I was able to finish all of my notes. You know, like I, I finished patient care maybe like at six o'clock or so, and by 6.15, all of my notes were in the chart. Whereas most providers take about 15 to 16 minutes to really like sit down, think about it, have the sentence structure. It, it ends up being an additional cognitive burden. The accuracy currently is at about 88%. So we do want people to go back in and make edits to the charts themselves. But for the most part, there's not a lot of edits that are being made. There might be a sentence added here or there to kind of give the, uh, the chart a little bit more richness, but the, the text itself is actually very rich and sometimes even more accurate 
uh, compared to the kind of attending note that I would write, which, which would be like a very sparse two line thing that may or may not capture the whole conversation that we discussed. In terms of completeness, I think charts are reviewed at this point to be about 2.5 times more detailed than a manual entry. That's what I just mentioned about compared to my like attending notes. And then in a pilot test, we actually saw a 30% increase in patients. So providers also have a capacity to see more patients without feeling burnt out by the end of the day. So that's kind of where we're at right now in terms of some of the, the numbers that we're actually measuring. And hopefully we have information on things like quality of life and levels of burnout moving forward in the next two to three months as we like actually use this tool company-wide. Yeah, 30% is huge just for the number of patients you can see. That's that's a huge I know. number you need that's to the, comprehend. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, and I know, and I think that one of the fears that, that providers actually have is that this tool could be used to, you know, like if you're more efficient in patient care, like does that mean that people are going to pack on more patients? And I think that we have to be mindful of that as well, right? We don't like at the end of the day, it's seeing more people does become like an energy issue. But I think that if you're also taking away a big piece of what that cognitive burden at the end of the day actually is, I'm finding that I have more energy for patients in general, and I'm actually enjoying my job more. That's awesome. That's great to hear. And do you have any other particular use case that you found the hands-free charting to be particularly effective at? I think really what I have found is that I am more focused on the patient. I am more engaged with the patient. But we haven't yet like translated this particular tool into pulling in like discrete data information or like being able to track things or anything like that. And I'm hoping that that'll be something that we move towards in the future. But I think just the fact that I'm able to stay engaged, I, I actually like pointed it out to a patient the other day that I was like, can you believe that I'm not typing while I'm talking to you right now? <laughs> like I'm able to maintain eye contact. I'm fully able to participate in that patient encounter without actually like thinking about what I have to do next. The other thing that I think is really interesting is that as I am talking to patients about their physical exam, for example, like in order for this physical exam to be recorded in the note, I have to kind of articulate everything out loud, which actually has created a more trauma-informed experience for my patients. So when I listen to somebody's heart, for example, I'm out loud saying, great, I don't hear any murmurs, your heart sounds regular. Selfishly, it's so that it'll be recorded in the chart and I won't have to go back and do it later. And it takes a little bit of extra time, but all of a sudden the patient's like, oh cool, like she listened to my heart and that's what she heard. Or like, I will actively say like, if it's a, if it's a different exam, like, okay, so this is why, like this is what I'm examining. And then that also sparks a, an uh, interesting discussion of like, oh, so what are you looking for? What does that mean? And there's a component of patient education that's also included in that because of it. That's fantastic. I think bringing the patient in is always huge and maybe it even leads to questions about information that they either didn't tell you in the first place or they forgot about. So it's like win-win in all scenarios. For sure. Previously, you mentioned a term called provider burnout, and we did have a question that asked, how do you think that this new tool for AI plays into provider burnout? Could you maybe expand on that a little bit more? Yeah. So I think there's that balance again, right? Like it, it depends on how this tool is used in the future. Like if it is going to, right now, it's absolutely doing what it's supposed to be doing. And I think that as a company, Carbon is really focused on using AI to do clerical work as opposed to using AI to do any sort of clinical decision making. And I think that that's a big piece of making sure that the provider is still able to make the decision, still able to kind of like work with the patient so that we're not introducing bias yet into like the clinical decision making piece of it, which could contribute to burnout, right? Like if you feel like you've lost autonomy over something, if you feel like you're not able to practice the way that you want to practice, if you are feeling that, you know, you're overburdened with the volume of people that you have to see or the tasks that you have to complete. Ideally, a generative AI tool would remove a lot of that cognitive burden so that you can actually interact with the patients. There is, like I mentioned before, that like if we're able to remove that cognitive burden, what are the, you know, how do you prevent it from becoming just another way of like getting you to do more? And I could see that being an issue in the future, 
but that's definitely something that we have to be vigilant about. Right now, I think I'm just really happy with how my day has been going. So I think it's it's a positive for my burnout or my experience of burnout for sure. And even though AI can be used in a variety of different ways in the healthcare field, we did have some people coming in asking, how can AI be used to capture someone's diagnosis? Is that something that you could touch on based on your experience with this new tool? Yeah, so this tool is not so much doing diagnosis as it is just reporting. It can make suggestions, but I think, again, we want to be mindful of like whenever AI starts to make suggestions or AI starts to do diagnoses, that we're not basing it on information that has bias already introduced into it. In the future, I think that it could provide some clinical decision-making support. Right now, I think that as a reporting mechanism and as like a note-taking mechanism, we're really kind of focused on how rich we can capture the experience of the conversation between the patient and the provider. And I have more of a personal question only because in my old research, I used to look at big data all the time related to genetics. So looking for any genetic trends that we might see in a population. And I was just curious if you think that this technology could potentially be leveraged to help find maybe different trends in particular populations that you're seeing. Probably at some point, definitely. Right now, I don't think so. <laughs> but in the future, I think that that's, that's definitely a skill that we could. A single person isn't going to be able to go through these large data sets with like volumes and volumes of information. And also, like in order to be able to capture that level of information, we have to be able to develop trust with our patients. We have to be able to show them that this is not going to be used in a way that's only going to cause like detrimental things. I think to go off a little bit on a tangent, I think the European Union recently decided to come out with some guidelines on what should AI be used for. I know one of the things that they wanted to not use AI for was things like facial recognition. And that's because it's shown that using facial recognition in terms of like law enforcement isn't super accurate, the technology isn't great, and it actually leads to a lot of like poor decision making. These tools are not necessarily trained on a population that's all white males, for example, because otherwise it's gonna continue to kind of reinforce those biases as well. We've got some work to do in that department, I think. Definitely, and that's good to know that it's continuing to grow and continuing to keep turning over to find those new ways that it can be most optimal for all individuals. Yeah, absolutely. If we can get large diverse sets of information, I think that it is absolutely a way that we could provide better care to patients who are under-resourced in the long term. I think I know the answer to this question based on our conversation so far, but just to reiterate, can AI actually help a physician have more time with their patient? Absolutely. And I think I have noticed that the quality of the time that I'm spending with patients is also improved. So even if it's still a small amount of time, I'm more engaged. The patient has my full attention. And so I'm able to work with the patient at a much higher human to human capacity than I was otherwise. This was so perfect to hear more information about AI and the healthcare space. I think we answered a lot of people's questions about what they had and what it looks like actually being implemented. And we can see firsthand how it's improving physicians like yourself. So I really appreciate you taking the time and sharing your experiences and also educating us all on what AI in healthcare looks like. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. It's It's been a great conversation. Of course, and be sure to stay tuned for more episodes with Carbon Health so we can continue to ask more questions to various physicians to get answers right to you. So stay tuned for our next session. Thank you, bye.